Uh, so tropical Africa is home to at least 25,000 plant species and protecting these wild plants is important because we rely on this biodiversity for lots of things. My favourite definition of biodiversity is this one, biodiversity is life. But there's a tension because wild plants are important but so is economic development. This photo is of a bauxite mine in Guinea. Mining is very destructive but the mining sector contributes 25% of the national income. So the challenge is to help countries to develop their economies without needlessly damaging their biodiversity assets. Uh, today I'm talking about our approach to plant conservation in the context of bauxite mining in Guinea. Uh, this is Guinea, a country in West Africa. It has around 3,000 plant species, of which 8% or so are threatened red-listed species. And this is bauxite. Bauxite is a rock that's the main source of aluminium. Aluminium demand is increasing, and Guinea has more bauxite than any other country. 40% of the world's bauxite reserves are found in Guinea. The government are keen to increase production of bauxite, and they've issued mining titles which cover a large proportion of the western and central region of Guinea. Bauxite is associated with these lateritic boe outcrops. The soil is very thin, so the natural vegetation is uh, short grasses and small herbs. And the boe forms plateaus within a matrix of woodland and riverine forest. Bauxite is very, found very close to the surface, so it's strip mined. It's loaded into rail cars or it travels by road to a port and then overseas for processing. Uh, this is the concession we were working with last winter in the red box. Uh, it's about 50 kilometres wide and the proposal includes a 125 kilometre haul road and new port infrastructure. This is a picture of the only company infrastructure in the concession and it's literally a stake in the ground. Um, by Guinean law, applications for mining titles must include um, an environmental and social impact assessment, or ESIA, and an ESIA describes the baseline conditions of the site, as well as ways to eliminate, reduce, or offset harmful consequences. So we're um, writing the botanic baseline for the ESIA, but we're part of a team tackling uh, all sorts of other taxa. So from the point of view of describing a true biodiversity baseline, lack of any pre-existing development in the concession is ideal. Uh, from the point of view of a comfortable life as a botanist, it's not the dream job. Um, this is Botany HQ. Uh, it's very remote. There's no uh, telephone coverage, no internet, no mains electricity, no running water. And this is a picture of the town at Wendumbo which I think captures the logistical challenges of working here quite succinctly. Um, the population density is low, but there are around 74 villages in the concession. About one third of primary age children go to school, but only six sat any national exams because of clashes with the farming calendar. The closest secondary school is um, outside of the uh, well, it's the only one in its prefecture, and the prefecture is a big area. Uh, here's a familiar comparison um, to Surrey and uh, a good number of neighbouring counties as well. And only 14 children passed their baccalaureate in that one school, so in the prefecture in 2011. So the very great majority of children finish school age with no qualifications and no or low literacy um, which is true of their parents and grandparents. And it's heartbreaking because there's no real sign of change, um, at least not without the mining. And I could tell you uh, the same story of gross deprivation for healthcare. Um, the way we do our fieldwork is called Rapid Botanic Survey, or RBS. RBS sits between um, traditional herbarium collecting and measured ecological or forestry type plots. We sample at a network of points across the concession and across every apparently different vegetation type. And when we're doing one of our samples, we record or collect every vascular plant species that we find. 
So our samples are not of a predetermined size. Rather, we choose the center of the sample and then work out collecting for a few hours within the same vegetation type until we're not finding anything new. And uh, our, that's because our freeform samples allow us to sample awkwardly shaped vegetation like a riverine forest strip. Um, so we can sample each vegetation type in a really pure way. And also because, as everyone who's ever done a plot before knows, the most interesting plants are always growing just the wrong side of the string. <laughs> Those plants are pressed in newspapers. And what we end up with is a checklist of all the species uh, found living together in that vegetation type, in that place, on that day. I also asked our local guides what they called each plant, so the local name and how they use it. Um, just simple information, no trade secrets. For example, here's Vismia guineensis being used as a medicine for malaria. There's an acanthe acanthaceae herb um, to make babies strong, um, some wild fruits for eating. Specimens have to be dried, and without electricity, that's charcoal or gas. And assuming you don't accidentally burn down all your specimens, then you end up with, in this case, 2,000 specimens that need I identifying. And we identify species with reference to the herbarium in Conakry, room on the right at the top, um, and also to online resources. All the uh, type specimens of African plants are online. Our aim is to identify conservation priority species and landscapes. So we have to put some information around these species. Uh, so we manage a database that brings together many of the records of plants that have been collected in tropical Africa. Um, it's the largest database there is for tropical African species distributions, and it holds more than 3 million records of about 25,000 more species. There are lots of ways for a plant or an area to be important for conservation. Um, but globally rare species, also called restricted range species or local endemics, are important because they're inherently vulnerable to extinction. And we can quantify what we mean by globally rare using the database. Species are assigned to one of four categories of global rarity called a star rating. On average, black star species are found in 2.7 degrees squares globally. Uh, Green star species have wide distributions, and gold and blue star species are intermediate. We categorize the ranges rather than using exactly their area of occupancy so that we aren't being artificially precise, given the uncertainty that we know exists in the distribution data. The thresholds of occupancy are empirically derived from species distributions in Ghana, and black star species ranges align well with what um, many botanists would agree is a rare species. Species or infraspecific taxa may be upgraded or downgraded uh, depending on their sparseness or taxonomic distinctness. We use area of occupancy rather than extent of occupancy because it better reflects the actual territory available to a species. And we use degree squares as the resolution for measuring area of occupancy because it's a compromise between including records that aren't finely localized whilst being fine enough to be relevant. Each star category has a weight, and those weights are assigned as an inverse to the area of occupancy, with green star downgraded to zero instead of one. So blue star species are three times rarer than green star species and have a weight of three. Gold star species are three times rarer again. Um, black, star, black star species three times rarer again with a weight of 27. And we use the weights to calculate a hotspot score for a list of species. So let's imagine that we wanted to calculate a hotspot score for this forest and say we found one black star species, one gold star species, one blue, and four green. We would add up the weights and divide by seven, the total number of species, times by 100 
to calculate the quantitative hotspot score of this forest as 557. And green star species are downgraded to zero just so the metric starts at zero. And in real life, it should be calculated from all the species in the sample, not just seven. So this metric reflects the concentration of globally rare species in the plant community. And it's a property we call bioquality. Uh, so it's not taking number of species into account, which behaves nicely because one can separate um, global rarity as a property of a plant community away from richness as a property of a plant community. Here are some West African examples of species with those different sizes of range. Uh, every plant species in tropical Africa has one of these pub star ratings and they're published. This is useful um, for conservation at the species level uh, because um, around 7% of the world's plantless species have been assessed for the red list, for example. Uh, so it's just it's something to put in place. And at the plant community level, it means that anyone can go anywhere in tropical Africa and calculate uh, a, a, one of these hotspot scores for the place and compare that score um, in a standard way to any other place in tropical Africa. Using the database and the star ratings, we've calculated these hotspot scores across the continent. Uh, we can see Guinea um, scoring highly, along with most of the forest zone, although it's dwarfed by the tremendous rate of endemism that's associated with the Horn of Africa. This is an update to the 2016 maps. Um, you may also notice all the gaps, all the black area, uh, and that's because we don't have uh, enough records of what species live there to be able to calculate a score. These are the endemism patterns at half degree square resolution. Um, and one way we can fill those gaps uh, is to build a model using the cells that do have data to make predictions for the cells that don't. So we hypothesize that these endemism patterns can be predicted from variables like lithology, um, climate, uh, um, lithology, um, climate. And these are the predictions that the model makes. Uh, this is a random forest model, a type of decision tree machine learning. And we find that climate comes out as highly predictive of endemism patterns. Um, as well as lithology, and also interestingly, the stability of climate during Pleistocene glacial cycles. What we found in the concession was that the Boe system, along with the riverine forest, achieved the highest hotspot scores. So we find that the Boe is the most important vegetation type for plant bioquality in the landscape, and it's the area that will be directly impacted. And this is a theme that repeats over and over. Uh, one tends to find rare plants living in uh, places that are characterized by unusual environmental conditions um, because there's, there's spe specialized species that live there that don't have a wide territory. And this is the same pattern or the same theme that we can see in the um, continental model. Boe is an unusual habitat. And although there is a lot of it in Guinea, uh, there's very little to none of it in protected areas. Um, there's a lot of interest in mining it. Uh, these two species are both black star species, and they've both been assessed for the red list, thanks to the efforts of Kew Gardens Tropical Important Plant Areas of Guinea project. The riverine forest, which is uh, African lowland evergreen rainforest, occurring at its almost farthest western extent is under tremendous pressure. Uh, it persists in tiny fragments along rivers, uh, and the, which are the, uh, they're being developed for ports and um, roads and bridges. Uh, and they're also targeted for um, logging and cleared for farming. We found six black star species in this habitat. This uh, Strombosiopsis doesn't look much like um, Nana and could be a new species. Um, but even Nana is very rare. Uh, Cathormian rhombifolium is not listed as endangered, uh, but it's almost restricted to this part of Guinea, and it has a very sparse distribution along riverine forest only. 
Uh, overall, 67% of species had a Pula name, that's about 250 species, and 40% had a use, and that's about 150 species, say, which is quite high. And it's similar to the rates we found in uh, other studies we've carried out, for example, in Liberia. Uh, the majority of species are used medicinally to treat um, everything, really. Access to modern medicine is very low. Uh, there are also wild food species, um, fruits, um, some wild diascorea, for example. Uh, species used in construction, um, magical species. So by vegetation type, what we find is almost the opposite relationship uh, compared with global plant conservation priorities as measured by bioquality. So that the least useful vegetation types are the boe and the river rainforest, but for two different reasons. The, um, the boe is burnt, so that, which is this, so that cattle can eat the re-sprouting grasses um, and grass is generally used for thatch, roof thatch, um, but there are very few species specific uses. And the river iron forest was also not ranked particularly highly by informants. There isn't much of it and familiarity with it is low. Uh, and the most useful vegetation types were the savanna woodland type habitat that's found in a wide band right across um, Africa at this latitude um, and also secondary vegetation. And this sort of vegetation is, isn't important from a bioquality point of view, but from a local conservation point of view, it is. So it's important to ask people locally what they think of plants. Uh, here we have some maps that um, I think show the, both the importance and opportunity associated with integrating plant conservation into mining operations. Uh, initiatives with a national scope are really important, um, particularly for something like mining, where the impacts are cumulative. But the amount of uh, area in land and protected areas, or identified as key biodiversity areas, or tropical and plant areas, is, is small. And below we have concession maps for bauxite and iron. Um, and in contrast, the area of land that's under management by mining companies is a lot. They're sizable parcels of land. Um, the companies are invested in managing that land. Um, with a mining permit, at least, they have 25-year leases, which offers a good opportunity to run a consistent environmental management plan at the concession level. There are some non-negotiables, like bauxite has to be mined, but many things, like the placement of haul roads uh, or spoilage heaps can be moved. Um, there are opportunities for nurserying globally rare species and locally useful species uh, for plantations or for ex situ conservation. Uh, part of the concession can be put over to um, protect for protection or um, sustainable community use. Uh, and tighter control uh, on the remaining riverine forest patches, a reduction in small-scale logging and shifting agriculture would also be re really beneficial for plant conservation. Um, and longer term, there's restoration. And there's also the contribution to um, data collection and our primary science knowledge of plant species distributions. Um, these places are not well-known places on the whole. So I would argue that uh, rapid botanic survey and all that goes with it has an important role to play in allowing global biodiversity values um, to be identified and managed at these local scales and uh, for integrating global values with local conservation concerns. And by allowing conservation requirements to be fine-tuned at these local scales, we can hope to maintain corridors and local biodiversity benefits in between networks of protected areas uh, in landscapes which will inevitably become more fragmented as economic development progresses. Uh, so thank you to AMC and TEC for supporting their work and their um, open approach to science. 
to many botanists who have contributed to the database and to you for listening. <laughs>